Hello and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. We're so glad that you've joined us because we are here to talk about plants, maybe some bugs, but lots of plants and bugs. My name is Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department, College of Aces. So I can maybe give you some answers about perennials, maybe floral design type cut flowers, but there are three really talented people here with me and they can answer a lot of great questions too, so pay attention to their specialty and direct your question that way. Let's go first to you then, Chuck Voigt. Well, hello, Diane. I am Chuck Voigt, and I am recently retired from the Crop Sciences Department at the University of Illinois. Uh, my specialties are vegetables and herbs, uh, but uh, I can answer other things as well and, and, and do when everybody else Although Phil's Looks here, Phil's, Phil's pretty good at filling in. He doesn't know it, but he answers them anyway. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so tonight I brought a show and tell. Uh, and you, you see variegated plants uh, quite a bit. And usually they're, they're either uh, genetically variegated, which is pretty stable, or they're chimeras, which is, can be quite unstable. And that's what we have here. This is a, a snowflake uh, scented geranium, uh, scented pelargonium, and usually it has little little splotches of white on the leaves. And this one has decided to kind of go both ways. It's got these all white shoots up here, which have no chlorophyll and can't support themselves. So the the leaves are are gradually dying because they they can't feed themselves. While the ones that revert to all green are very efficient, and they'll eventually take over. Uh, so with a lot of these unstable variegated plants, you have to kind of watch them and then repropagate from a shoot that has the, the degree of variegation that you want because you know neither the all green nor the all white is really what it's about. It, it's called snowflake because it's got little flakes of snow on it. It's really pretty, but I can see why they're starting to die off and that won't make it. Yep. Well, very good. Thank you, Chuck. That's lots of fun. All right, let's go to the lady in the middle, Kelly Alsup. Okay, hello, my name is Kelly Alsup and I am a extension educator in horticulture. I serve uh, Livingston, McLean and Woodford counties in Illinois. I, uh, my background is in greenhouses, so I'm really good with indoor plants, but uh, I, I delve into uh, uh, integrated pest management, but however, I am being a little bit overshadowed by Phil here, so <laughs> he's probably the expert. Uh, but I did bring a show and tell also. What I brought was my absolute favorite house plant, and this is called a ZZ plant. How do you spell ZZ? ZZ. <laughs> uh, what what makes easy. it my favorite house plant is because anybody can grow it, really. Uh, low light requirements, um, you can almost neglect it. Actually, this one I pulled out of a co-worker's office and she is the, uh, the uh, worst at taking care <laughs> of plants and it's looking gorgeous. Another thing that I really love about it is that you don't really ever see any plant damage. It just has these beautiful glossy leaves all the time. Um, just uh, so it's a wonderful house plant, you know, get two or three of them, easy, easy to take care of. Uh, one of the things that have been coming into my office lately is a lot of people are getting cold damage on their house plants. And so one of the things that I tell them is if you have cold damage, just go ahead, let the de leaves die back, then cut them off and then stop watering it for a little bit and most likely it'll actually come back. Mm -hmm. So people are, if they ha are taking their house plants out right now in the cold weather, it will damage them. Cause this one likes 55 degrees or more. Okay. It is really glossy and very attractive. Very pretty, very I love nice. it. Z, 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 Z plant. Do you know any botanical things that would Make it easier to find if, if ZZ isn't. Do I do I know the botanical name of ZZ plant off my head? Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Look for ZZ. That'll be easy. Okay. Thanks, Kelly. And now <clears throat> next to you, Dr. Phil Nixon. I'm Phil Nixon. I'm an extension entomologist at the University of Illinois, which means I do bugs. 
<laughs> and I have a, an email from a viewer that says, I had little white worms in my raspberries that I believe are spotted wing drosophila. We also have strawberries, blackberries, peach trees, and apple trees. What can I do to get rid of them? Well, you can see by the arrows, the, uh, the little uh, uh, flies are relatively small. They look very similar to <coughs> the fruit flies that come in around your tomatoes in the fall and so on. Uh, but unlike the fruit flies, you will end up having a, uh, they, these have a saw-like ovipositor, which means that they kind of have a handsaw for an egg-laying device, allowing them to penetrate and lay eggs into, into complete fruit, although they do it after they start to ripen. They will hit essentially any berry, and that includes not only raspberries and blackberries, but also uh, grapes and blueberry and cherries. Uh, they will get into some soft fruits such as nectarine and peaches, but really not into harder fruits such as apples are not really attacked or pears. They will get into uh, uh, rotting or split tomatoes. They're not going to be able to get in through the skin of whole tomatoes, but if they're split, you'll get uh, a little meat bonus in your tomatoes when you slice them. Uh, the, the larvae live inside and, uh, and are quite small. We have been eating them for a long time, or several years anyway, and not known, them, known about them. They are pretty well widespread throughout the Midwest and uh, are essentially uh, going to be in any fruit that you're, go that you're going to pick when it's ripe. The way you avoid them is you pick it as soon as you can pick it, uh, rather than letting it get ripe. Remove any rotting fruit or old fruit that you might have, any dropped fruit. A good thing to do at this, at, in the winter time is to go out and remove any debris and so on. The adult flies over winter uh, in the Midwest and are waiting there. And anything you can do to pull away the leaf litter and so on to expose them to something else that will eat them before they wake up is just, just helps you out to a great extent. We primarily control this by sanitation, removing any fruit that has, that has gone by the wayside. They will also live in some wild fruits such as elderberry and viburnum berries and even buckthorn berries. And so there are various sources around that they can be. Spinosad is an insecticide, many times sold as bullseye, that is effective with a couple of sprays. But for the homeowner, your best bet is sanitation. Sounds like complete sanitation too. Yes, to keep you on need it. to get every last berry or strawberries are also attacked. You do not leave anything oh. in, the, in the garden to feed these for weeks after harvest. Okay. Is there any season when they're particularly bad? When there are berries out. So uh, oh. they, tend to get, they tend to get more numerous as the season goes on mm -hmm. because they lay lots of eggs and reproduce quite well and, and build up. And many times uh, you can see them on the outside of the berries if you look close. Okay. Like the pictures that you saw. All right. Well, that's encouraging. <laughs> Thank you, Phil, very much. Let's go next to our Did You Know segment. Garlic is a member of the onion family. There are both hard neck and soft neck varieties of garlic. Hard neck garlics have long stalks, while soft neck garlics do not. That's it in a nutshell, isn't it? Since uh, Chuck does garlic. I Hence the name. Yeah. <laughs> or in a clove, as the case may be. Ah. Yeah, that's yeah. true. All right. Well, we have some callers and we're ready to go to the phone lines. Donald has a question about tomatoes. Very appropriate. And let's go there on line two to Donald. Hi. Hello. What's your question? Well, I got some uh, pots or rubber tubs that are two feet tall and 18 inches wide, and I put a, about six or eight inches of mulch in the bottom and drill holes in it and planted tomatoes. Well, last year wasn't a very good tomato year, but mm -hmm. I just wondered if I can do that successfully. So if we don't count last year, can he do that successfully? Well, probably. Um, in that size pot, <clears throat> you might not want to use uh, big indeterminate tomatoes. You might want to stick to something that's going to stay a little bit smaller because um, you just don't have the soil volume to mm -hmm. keep a 15 foot tomato plant going. Um, should work out okay. Um, 
I'd so smaller tomatoes like patio tomatoes or cherries or something <coughs> like that might do a little better? Yeah, or, or, or some of the determinate or ones. Or determinate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah the, probably not the, the more vigorous determinants, but okay. just some of the <coughs> regular determinants. Okay, so the question, your answer is yes, you can do the smaller ones. Thank you very much, Donald. And let's go to Richard's question. Looks like it's about ground ivy, and he's on line three. Hi there, Richard. Hi, thanks for taking my call. You're welcome. I planted some vinca a few uh, couple years ago, and last summer I started getting that ground ivy, I think they call it. Is there any way to get that out of vinca, or do I just need to kill everything? Okay, so vinca, which I take it is the periwinkle vinca, vinca minor. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm looking at everyone else. <laughs> uh, it reminds me of, of a story I heard about Rosemary Nichols. She's, her, her maiden name is Nichols. She's from Nichols um, oh, Gardens. Garden Seeds. Mm -hmm. And for punishment when she was a girl, they sent her out. She had to weed the thyme. <laughs> um, so when you get two competing ground covers, it, it really becomes difficult. Plus with ground ivy, you get not just vegetative regrowth, but you get seeds if it's been there for any length of time. So, even but it was just one year. It's just the last year. Well, that Could you know, help. if if you're going to have to be really diligent about getting rid of it, or uh, you know, go scorched earth and start over, would you know, use Roundup or something on it to to kill everything, and then. Uh, Hopefully the ground mm -hmm. ivy won't come back if it hasn't been established well right. enough, but it may take more than one application because gr the, <laughs> the, the ground cover is probably going to be more susceptible <laughs> to Roundup than the, than the ground ivy is because it's, it's pretty, pretty pernicious. Isn't that great? <laughs> but that's often the case. You can also go with a ha glass half full, and that is that the ground ivy flowers are a tremendous source of food for pollinators and do great for that, whereas vinca is eh. So, uh, hmm. you know, as far as if you're wanting to help with pollinators, uh, Creeping Charlie or Ground Ivy is just great stuff that blooms early. Uh, you see the bees tanking up on it when nothing else other than the dandelions are blooming. Both of those are just tremendous pollinator plants. So it's however you want to look at it. But remember, if you let it flower a year or two, then you're going to have a seed bank for, you know, up to 50 years. So. Yeah. Um, no matter what the season, you t it comes back for you. If see? you fall in love with it, make sure it's a, it's a long-lasting love because... <laughs> Glass half full or half empty? Okay, that was a, a good way of looking at it. So just figure out what you want to do and go from all of these answers. We'll give you the choice. All right, let's go to Mary's question, and, and it's about orchids on line four. Hello, Mary. Hi. I just bought a grocery store orchid that basically is a rescue project. It's one of the little ones with the small blooms. I don't know what species, but it's in a like a two inch or smaller pot and it's obviously pot bound and I'm going to repot it and I'm just wondering how big a pot should I use. Okay, take it away Kelly. Well, um, I, if I were to repot that orchid, I would uh, take it out of the smaller pot. I would not pot it up too much, um, depending on if it's, uh, like if it's just your Phalaenopsis, it actually has roots that grow aerial. Um, I would go through and, you know, m remove all of that soil, maybe take out some of those brown looking roots and then go ahead and pot it up just a little bit more. For it, Like, I mean, if it's in a four inch pot, then I would go to a six inch pot. I would never go to a 12 inch pot. And then, um, you know, just give it really nice soil, a mix of, uh, I always do a mix of soil, bark, and charcoal for orchids. And I wouldn't pot it up just yet. I'd maybe wait a little bit longer. I usually don't pot things up until maybe April. Um, another thing is if it has big fat leaves and white aerial roots, it's a Phalaenopsis, but if it's smaller, I, I don't really know offhand what it might be without seeing a picture. There could be Dendrobium. I mean, it could be Oncidium, but I don't know if those do as well. So, but anyway, it's a, if it's a smaller one. 
but you'll, yeah, you'll rescue it and find out when it flowers. Orchids are one of the only plants where I actually go through, loosen the soil, and remove any dead or brown roots, and then I'll replant it. I would never do that with another type of plant other than orchid. Mm -hmm. Okay, I like that you know that it's a rescue project, so that's really good going in. And so whatever happens, you're good with. So keep up the good work, Mary, and thank you, Kelly. Well, let's go to Joe's question, and he's got a Blackberry question for us on line five. Hello there, Joe. Hello, yes, we have uh, some, some um, triple crown uh, thornless blackberries, and they have uh, grown some big trailers, and I was wondering what do we do with those things? Big, uh, like aerial, like long. Is that what you mean by trailers? Yeah, they're long, and, and okay. if I just leave them, they'll root out. And then this thing, if I let it go, I, we'd have blackberries all over the yard. Okay, that's what I thought you yeah, meant. All that's, right. That's kind of the nature of, of blackberries, is they they're good colonizers. Um, usually, with 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 blackberries, particularly in a home garden situation where you don't have lots and lots and lots of space, but commercially as well, you'd want to cut them back. Um, you know, depending if, if how, how trailing the whole plant is, if it's, if it's very trailing, then you might want to think about trellising it and get, getting some of them up. Sort of like you would grapevines where you would, you would cut them back and, and, and get them on there and then what remains can flower and fruit and get plenty of sunshine, sh sunshine and, and um, you know, so if you, if you don't want to propagate it with them, you can probably cut those back and then just choose uh, a few major branches and cut those back so that hopefully they can support themselves or, or trellis them if, if they can't. Okay, so it sounds like you're doing well because yeah. they're really growing well, those blackberries. And thornless are the way to go. Well, let's go to some emails and I'm gonna start with you, Chuck. Okay, uh, the, the title on this one is Joe Pie, but, but we're gonna get to the real problem. Are you able to tell us what is strangling our Joe Pie? It's yellow in color and sticky to the touch. Well, sadly, there's a picture here, and <laughs> <coughs> what we're looking at is dotter, which is a parasitic plant. Uh, comes in quite often on uh, bedding plants that are shipped into uh, a certain unnamed mitten-shaped state. Um, <laughs> um, and it's it's a really bad one. Uh, uh, our friend Jim Schuster talks about this one, and I've already mentioned scorched earth for the ground ivy. Uh, that <coughs> when 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 Jim's talking about this, basically you need to remove that, get rid of it, get it away. If it's grown as extensively as this, it has probably dropped seeds, which is not a good thing. Uh, and you want to remove all the plant material, cultivate it for the rest of that season and the next season never letting plant material get up to where a germinating seed has anything to live off of. And if you just keep cultivating it, so you bring up any seeds that there are for the rest of the, the season when you remove it in the next season, then you can probably cautiously plant something there, but be on the lookout because if it shows itself again, you got to get rid of it before it can drop a seed. It's, it's, it, it, it's really a, a pain. And fortunately, knock wood, I have not have personal experience with it, but um, it's really a tough one. As you were talking about it, it's almost like you need to put a caution tape out around the spot that you're working on. And, and I'm not and saying that in a funny way. No, I mean, and, and just remember, not just not just no flowering plants, but no weeds can be there because it can live off any green growing plant. So wow. you need to keep that ground bare and keep working it up so that hopefully you get all those seeds exposed to light or whatever it takes to make and them germinate. And you don't want to forget to keep looking at and, and, it. And because it's, para yeah, because it's parasitic, it can't survive on its own. It doesn't have chlorophyll. It's sort of like the white part of the, of okay. the center geranium. Uh, it has to attach itself to something or the little seedling will die. And that's what you want. You want all the little seedlings to germinate and die because there's no food around for them. Okay. Wow, boy, Jim would have been, Jim and Schuster would have been excited about that one, but you did a great job on it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, dot, daughter and mistletoe oh, are, really are his two him, favorite yeah, uh, really gets parasitic him going. plants. <laughs> All right, so Kelly, we're next to you. Okay, I have a question about impatience. Um, the, uh, the caller says that 
impatient, they got a really good start, they're blooming nicely, then they get scraggly with few or no flowers, what happened? Well, um, my first guess was over fertilization and patients don't really need a lot of fertilizer compared to say a petunia, which really loves a lot of fertilizer. And so they, it, the, all of that nitrogen really caused that fast leggy growth and sort of prevented them from flowering. Um, if it ever got like this for me, what I would do is cut them back, back off of the watering and fertilizing and um, hope for new growth. And then that new growth would probably then flower. Um, it could also be maybe uh, inconsistent watering and patients do like to be consistently watered. Um, Does so, that container have drainage holes? I was wondering that too. Uh, yeah, and uh, you know, uh, not watering know. enough sometimes has the same symptoms as watering too much. And mm -hmm. so um, that's a very good point, Diane. I don't um, know. If it, it didn't have good drainage <clears throat> and, um, you know, nice fresh soil, um, that could possibly be it also. But it definitely looks like a cultural issue to me. Okay. So, so not downy mildew? Um, well, I didn't want to uh, diagnose downy mildew because it really hasn't, there hasn't been a lot of talk about it lately in Illinois. Okay. Um, you know, there was that big scare in 2012, 2013, where the plant clinic was telling us about this downy mildew issue and uh, extension was discouraging people from planting in patients, but I have not seen downy mildew in my area. Well, and they have worked to, to breed in mm -hmm. resistance That's to right. it as well. But just, just looking at the picture, it, that looked a lot like the ones that were diagnosed as downy mildew as well. But uh, all the things you said would exacerbate downy mildew too, so. Mm -hmm. Definitely. <coughs> Well, there we go. So thank you for that. And let's go to yours next, Phil. Renee from the Clinton area says that last year, my thornless locust tree had millions and millions of pods. I assume she's exaggerating a little bit. <laughs> uh, for the previous 15 years, the pods were quite abundant, but last year the quantity was immense. However, this year I have no pods, none. Not complaining, but I was wondering the reason behind this conundrum. Well, it's a beautiful picture of a pod. Yeah, a beautiful <laughs> picture of a pod. That's, kind of a that's a pod only a mother could. <laughs> <It is. laughs> At any rate, uh, kind of like apple trees uh, or other trees, as a matter of fact, when they fall under hard times and they feel like they might be kicking the bucket, so to speak, they try to have as many kids as possible in their last gasp. And remember that a uh, couple and three years ago, we had some ver a very serious cold winter. We had a couple of severe droughts and even a and plant that is good as the honey locust tree in surviving strange situations can end up with, with a problem. And so it would have tried to reproduce itself because it thought that it might be in bad shape, used up its energy and thus, like an apple tree, which will produce very heavily one year and almost none the next if you do not judiciously prune off the extra apples, uh, it essentially used up its energy and didn't have anything to produce uh, seeds this year in all likelihood. So it's, a, uh, it's, it's that sort of thing that's happened and it will probably kind of alternate a little bit until it evens mm -hmm. out and it will probably go to uh, a regular uh, potty year every year for you. Uh, and, uh, and honey locusts are very close to my heart because their bugs got me my PhD, so I get feel good about those. Uh -huh. And an interesting little side note is, is they've done some research and to figure out, particularly when you have something like that has big seeds like that that don't get around very much on their own, you wonder what was doing it. Uh, they've determined through some tests that probably North American camels used to be the ones that would eat these and move them around. Uh, when, this, when the pods are very green, they're very sweet, and they found out, interestingly, that, that New World camels, i.e. llamas and alpacas, don't like them. The Old World camels love them, 
And so uh, that's apparently how they got around and until they got the lawnmower to scarify the seeds and cut them up so they will sprout. He kind of had a bad time going on it for the last few thousand years, but now lawnmowers do a good job of getting us new honey locusts. Because we were all thinking, say what, when you were <laughs> talking about that? <laughs> talking about my camels? That's really interesting. Oh yeah, well, there used to be camels in North America. Huh. Mm -hmm. But the new world ones do not like not it. Not so. like it, so obviously hmm. the ones that were in North America were not the same ones that were in South America. Well, how perhaps. very interesting. You learn a lot on this show. Take and some something notes. you can really use once yeah, in a while. Yeah, oh yeah, you can really use that. <laughs> <laughs> Just drop it into every conversation you have in the next week. Yeah, and you'll be sitting by yourself. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, thank you so much for watching. We always have fun. You have a great week gardening. Goodbye.